Thank you. The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, this week, Margaret McCall from Lanarkshire described her ordeal when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She faced a three-month wait for NHS treatment in Scotland, and Margaret didn't know if she had that long. So she used £27,000 of her life savings for faster private treatment in England. Margaret said this, cancer kills if left untreated and the Scottish Government is allowing this to happen. We shouldn't have to go to London or elsewhere. First Minister, Margaret's right, isn't she? First Minister. Uh, Margaret uh, is right that uh, nobody should have to feel that their only option is to pay privately to go anywhere else outside of Scotland uh, for uh, cancer treatment. And can I uh, pass on uh, my sympathy to uh, Margaret for what is an unacceptable uh, ordeal that she has had to go through? If I can try to give uh, some context, I know Douglas Ross uh, and indeed others in this chamber and outside of this chamber are aware of the significant impact that the COVID pandemic had on our health services right across the UK, including on cancer services. I think one of the most difficult decisions this government had to take during that COVID uh, period was, for example, to have to pause screening, cancer screening, for a period of a number of months. And we are still dealing with the impacts of that difficult uh, decision. In terms of ovarian cancer uh, more, uh, more specifically, um, let me try to offer some assurance if I can in terms of the latest figures uh, that in Scotland 94.7% of women, so over 9 out of 10 women, are receiving their first treatment for ovarian cancer within 31 days of a decision uh, to treat. That's as per uh, the latest uh, figures. But uh, in those situations where that is not happening or has not happened, in the case of Margaret, then I fully accept uh, Douglas Ross's proposition that that's not an acceptable state of affairs. Douglas Ross. The First Minister, as I thought he would, mentions COVID, but they had COVID in England as well, where Margaret got treatment because she could pay £27,000 for that. She went south of the border to get it. And the First Minister wanted to offer his reassurance to ovarian cancer sufferers. So let's look at what Target ovarian cancer has said. They say Scotland has one of the worst survival rates in Europe for this cancer. People need urgent treatment to save their lives, but in the SNP-run NHS, they wait months. Mm -hmm. And Margaret is worried about what happens if her cancer comes back. And she's also worried for people who don't have life savings to pay for treatment. Public Health Scotland statistics show that people from the most deprived areas of Scotland are 74% more likely to die from cancer than those in wealthier areas. So, First Minister, what are people meant to do if they get cancer and they can't afford to go out with Scotland, Scotland for their treatment? First Minister. Well, the NHS in Scotland uh, will be there uh, to assist and to wear, uh, and treat uh, where they possibly can. Unless I misunderstood uh, Douglas Ross, and I'm willing to correct the record uh, if I did, uh, my understanding is that in Margaret's case, she went for private treatment. Uh, in, in, in England. So, of course, the services in NHS England are also being in, impacted, as have the services in NHS Wales, as have the services undoubtedly in NHS uh, Scotland. Uh, Douglas Ross is uh, absolutely within his right to ask uh, the, the question around uh, ovarian cancer. I'm more than happy, given uh, the time limits that we have in First Minister's questions, to write with him in with far more detail. But we are taking the issue around ovarian cancer specifically, as he's asked about that, uh, with the utmost seriousness, the Scottish Cancer Network, <coughs> excuse me, presiding officer, will be establishing a new ovarian cancer clinical network, which will ensure equity of access to treatment for all women with ovarian cancer. And that's specific to the point that Douglas Ross raises around the inequality that may exist in relation to uh, an access accessibility of services. We've also committed £10.5 million to health boards to improve capacity and access to uh, systemic anti-cancer therapy by 2027, uh, with three million of additional funding released uh, this year. As I say, there is a lot more that I can say in terms of detail of what we're doing specifically around ovarian cancer, uh, but in the interest of brevity, I will write to Douglas Ross uh, with that further detail. Douglas Ross. Well, I'll welcome that response when it comes, and I'll share it with uh, another member of the public we've spoken to. We spoke to Irene Hartshorn from AIR, and she was told she needed to wait 12 weeks for ovarian cancer surgery. 
She told us this morning, and these are Irene's words, I felt powerless. You know that all the time the illness is getting worse and worse. If I had waited, I think I would be dead by now. Her sister paid for her to get treatment in London. But Irene wanted us to ask the First Minister this question. First Minister, why are the resources not in place in Scotland for this kind of treatment that Irene had to go south of the border for? First Minister. Well, we are investing in our national health services. Why this year we gave an additional billion pounds to the health service, taking it to 19 uh, billion pounds. So we are not just investing in the health service, but importantly investing in the people that provide the treatment. It's why we assured that we did everything we possibly can uh, to ensure that they were paid uh, fairly and that we didn't lose any days uh, on the NHS uh, to industrial action. In terms of staffing uh, as well under the SNP, there's been an almost 100% increase in consultant oncologists uh, since we uh, took uh, power. So we are investing in the individuals in our health service. We are investing and ensuring there's early detection of cancer as well with our rapid cancer diagnostic uh, services. And we are specifically on ovarian cancer, as that's been an issue that's been raised by Douglas Ross. We are seeking to do what more we uh, we're seeking to, to explore what more we can do for faster treatment. I go back to the latest statistics that were published, uh, which I hope provide some assurance, though I accept fully their cold comfort for those who've already had to pay for treatment, but to provide some level of reassurance, the latest statistics show that 94.7%, almost 95% of women are receiving their first treatment for ovarian cancer within 31 days of a decision to treat. And we want to, con want to consider what more we can do to improve that figure further. The shows. I think those answers will be so bitterly disappointing for Margaret and Irene and hundreds of others that are so distressed at having to pay so much money to go out with Scotland to get their treatment. The experts are echoing exactly what the patients are telling us. Dr Hume of Cancer Research UK said the problems in cancer care are fixable if the new cancer strategy is fully funded and implemented now. But the evidence shows that the resources are not in place. An official statistics this week showed that one in four Scottish patients suspected of having cancer don't start their treatment within the 62-day target. And a new Freedom of Information request that we've had answered shows that one patient in NHS Grampian this year has waited 156 days, more than five months, to start chemotherapy. Hamza Youssef was Health Secretary for two years and cancer waiting times grew. He's now First Minister. What's he going to do to sort it? First Minister. Well, as I uh, have referenced, the 31-day uh, uh, cancer stat uh, has improved in terms of the previous quarter. So that's uh, showing, I hope, uh, a journey of recovery that we're absolutely on. And we have to accept that recovery will take a number of years. Uh, Douglas Ross made a few points, actually a number of them of which I uh, agree with. And he was reading on behalf of those who work in the NHS that the cancer strategy, the 10-year strategy that we have published, must be fully funded. We agree. We accept that very premise and that very point. So that's why, for example, this year we've increased our investment in the health service quite substantially. And of course, uh, later this year, we'll give an update for our budget 24-25. But I accept fully the premise uh, that the strategies we bring forward must be uh, funded. I also accept the point that the 62-day target uh, must be improved. Uh, there is no doubt that that has been impacted and affected by the pandemic. But there, frankly, was challenges around the 62-day target pre-pandemic too, and that's why the, the, the cancer plan, the cancer strategy we have, will seek to target those cancers, those cancer types, that we know we've traditionally struggled with in relation to the 62-day target. So from a Scottish Government perspective, we'll continue that record investment in the NHS, we'll make sure our staff are paid fairly, and we'll make sure we continue to have uh, adequate staffing uh, within our health service. But uh, let me give an absolute assurance, not just to Douglas Ross, but to all of those who are watching and listening, that the treatment of cancer, early diagnosis and then the early treatment of cancer is an absolute number one priority for the government that I lead. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President Officer, cancer remains Scotland's biggest killer. And we know there is a direct link between speed of diagnosis, treatment and survival rates. 
This week's statistics revealed that one in four cancer patients had faced delays in treatment. That is 1,130 people starting treatment late in the last three months alone. Everyone a son or daughter, everyone a loved one, someone loved by a family waiting anxiously. In fact, none of Scotland's health boards met the 62-day standard for starting cancer treatment. Macmillan have warned that staff are stretched to breaking point and Cancer Research UK called the delays unacceptable. So does the First Minister agree with the experts or has his government become complacent in the fight against Scotland's biggest killer? First Minister. We absolutely haven't become uh, complacent. I hope we can demonstrate that through the work we've done uh, with key stakeholders in relation to the cancer uh, strategy. Douglas Ross and Anna Sauer are both absolutely uh, right to raise uh, what is a crucial issue for people uh, right across Scotland. Let me in turn try to give uh, some assurances. We are recovering from a global pandemic. That global pandemic has absolutely had an impact not just on our health service, but of our cancer services. But if I look at the statistics and the figures, when I look at, for example, the 62-day pathway, we are treating 41.2% more patients on that pathway than we did uh, 10 years ago. And if I look at the 31-day pathway for which, the, uh, for which there has been an improvement, we are uh, treating 19.6% more patients than we did 10 years ago. So we are seeing more patients, the throughput, has increased over the, 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 the last decade. That's not uh, complacency at all, because there's clearly more to do, particularly around the 62-day pathway. Anna Sauer also raises the importance of diagnostic uh, waiting times. And again, the latest statistics show uh, an improvement in that regard. So we're not complacent. We'll continue to invest. And as I've said already, we'll continue to invest in ensuring that we have the adequate staff so that we can get treatment to people as early as they possibly can. Anna Sarwa. Presiding officer, COVID started three years ago. This government has not met the 62-day standard for 11 years. So cut the complacency and cut the excuses. Because we know that every, day, every delay risks lives. And we know that cancer deaths are higher than they should be. So far this year, there have been 398 more cancer deaths than experts would have ex expected. Avoidable and unnecessary deaths. And this week, it was also revealed that life expectancy in Scotland has dropped again. It's fallen back to a level not seen for over 10 years. There is no starker indication of failure than that. So will the First Minister take this opportunity to apologise for the lost decade on the SNP's watch? First Minister. Of course, when people don't uh, get the treatment uh, as quickly as they should or where targets are missed, then of course the government not just apologises, we have deep regret when that uh, is the case. Of course, Anna Sawa uh, forgets to mention the fact that what has happened over the last decade is over a decade of Westminster austerity, which we know every single external organisation that has an interest in poverty will tell you Members. that poverty is a clear determinant, is a clear factor of health inequality. So we will do our best to try to mitigate the impact of that Westminster austerity and we have put hundreds of millions of pounds from our budgets uh, on the table to protect from uh, that Westminster austerity. But in terms of what we're doing in relation to the NHS, I go back to the central point. Record investment, ensuring we pay our staff fairly, hence why there haven't been strikes in Scotland where there have been in health services across the UK, including uh, in Wales and in England. And we'll continue to invest in our staff and ensure that patients get the treatment they deserve as quickly as they possibly deserve. Anna Sauer. Presiding officer, the First Minister doesn't need to persuade me on how woeful the UK Tory government is, but that doesn't excuse the woeful record of this SNP government for the last 16 years. Every cancer delay raises the chance of avoidable death. And that's why patients should be diagnosed and start treatment in 62 days. But the FOI request has revealed the dire reality for too many patients. Some cancer patients have waited 191 days for diagnosis and treatment. 191 days. A cervical, patient, cervical cancer patient waited 217 days. A prostate cancer patient waited 334 days. And there was even a cancer patient that waited 385 days for diagnosis and to start treatment. You can't blame somebody else, somewhere else for that. That is the SNP's record. Over a year of anxiety before getting the help those cancer patients needed.
So why can't the First Minister see what many on his own benches can see, that the SNP have lost their way, have got complacent and no longer put the interests of the Scottish people first? First Minister. That is uh, simply untrue and that is why when it comes to who is trusted with the NHS, we tend to leave that verdict to the people of Scotland. The people of Scotland time and time again have given that verdict to the SNP and I can hear Anna Sawar shouting something about polls and of course in most of these polls, if not every single one of them, the SNP continue to lead Labour and continue to lead other political parties too. And the reason for that, after 16 years in government, is because of our stewardship Members. of vital public services uh, like the NHS. And let me just uh, remind Anna Sawar of a couple of points because I'm not disagreeing with the central premise that neither he nor Douglas Ross have raised, that there has to be improvements in the 62-day standard. And I agree with that, and I accept that. And there obviously has un undoubtedly been an impact uh, from COVID. But as things stand, we have seen an improvement in the 62-day standard compared to the previous quarter, where over 7 out of 10 patients are starting treatment within that 62-day standard. It has to be improved, so there is no complacency. And the median weight uh, in relation to the 62-day standard was 49 days. So we'll continue on that journey of recovery. We'll continue to invest in our health service, continue to invest in our staffing, and we'll continue to do what we can to ensure that patients, the public, are seen and treated as quickly as they possibly can. Question number three, Liz Smith. To ask the Sco First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to reports of widespread contamination at many of Scotland's outdoor swimming sites. First Minister. I would take um, some exception to the use of the term uh, widespread uh, planning officer, but the Scottish Government is committed to improving water quality at bathing waters across Scotland. Recent, report, recent reporting of these statistics has not interpreted SEPA's bathing water monitoring data correctly. Uh, since we introduced more stringent European standards in 2015, we have worked with SEPA, Scottish Water and key stakeholders to ensure there are now bathing, more bathing waters classified as good uh, or excellent than ever before, with 98% beating the water quality standards. That Scottish Water is working to install monitors on all its sewer outfalls in or near bathing waters to provide uh, near real-time spill data by December of next year. These actions will help inform bathers and support SEPA and Scottish Water's work to prioritise investment where, it's where it will most benefit uh, both our environment and our communities. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. I'm a bit surprised by that answer, First Minister, because the most recent investigations at Lower Largo in Fife, which tells it that it's the most polluted beach in Scotland, um, it breached the regulations on seven occasions so far in 2023, and on three occasions it was 50 times the contamination limit, which is a very serious health hazard. So can I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is going to do to increase the frequency of the checks on these beaches? And can I also ask the First Minister if he is as concerned as I am about the number of community swimming pool closures, which are obviously seen by many families as a safer alternative just now? First Minister. What I say to, to, to Liz Smith is, of course, the uh, situation that she mentions in relation to Lower Largo, I know it is, of course, a serious one, and my understanding is that there are, uh, there are uh, identified reasons uh, for that potential contamination. I know it's an issue that Scottish Water uh, and SEPA are looking at very seriously. I'm happy to, to write to Liz Smith uh, and ensure that cabinet, the, the appropriate Cabinet Secretary writes to Liz Smith uh, with the detail of what, is, uh, what actions are being taken in that specific example. But I do go back to the point and why I took exception to uh, Liz Smith suggesting that contamination was widespread is that point that 98% of Scotland's bathing waters currently achieve uh, the, the, the bathing water quality standard with more being rated excellent than ever before. Uh, so we do have good monitoring, we do have good quality of water uh, here in Scotland and on specifics of uh, Lower Lago, I'm more than happy to write to Liz Smith with the detail. Willie Rennie. I have to say I'm astonished by the answer from the First Minister. It's astonishingly complacent. Yeah. 50 out of 89 of the most popular beaches in Scotland are beyond safe standards for bathing. That should be an alarm bell for the First Minister. So when is he going to implement the proper measurement of all sewage outflows? Yeah. And when, at last, is he going to set legally binding targets yeah. to end the sewage dumping? First Minister. This is an issue that Scottish Water and SEPA uh, take uh, seriously. It's an, it's a, I've given the answer 
uh, in previous First Minister's questions around how, for example, that water uh, is being uh, monitored, how <coughs> the sewage outflows uh, are being uh, monitored in a comprehensive uh, monitoring programme that has cost uh, considerable uh, amounts of public investment has been underway over the last number of years. And of course, there is action to increase that monitoring uh, over the period uh, to come, again, which I'm happy to give more detail to Willie Rennes. So nobody uh, is complacent here. We are, I'm fully accepting that there are particular instances that must be investigated, where there must be action uh, that is taken. But I go back to that point that 98 per cent of the bathing waters currently achieve uh, that, uh, that, that quality standard, with more being rated as excellent than ever before. But on the specifics that uh, Willie Rennie raises, I'm more than happy to provide him and furnish him with answers uh, in detail uh, around what further monitoring is expected to take place. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I've raised before the issue of sewage contamination in Scotland's water, notably in the water of Leith in my region. I previously asked the Scottish Government for a meeting, but in August, the Cabinet Secretary advised me that she did not think a meeting would be useful. Will the Cabinet Secretary now agree to meet with me, urgently considering the clear severity of the issue across Scotland? First Minister. I'm more than happy, <clears throat> more than happy uh, of course, to uh, consider uh, that uh, meeting and ensure that the Cabinet Secretary considers that uh, meeting in terms of in terms of uh, outflow monitoring, Scottish Water has carried out a more comprehensive Scotland-wide environmental study programme to assess the impacts uh, of its assets on water quality, and that was during the period 2015 to 2021, that investment period uh, costing £40 million. And the computer models Scottish Water developed allows it to understand when those combined sewer outflows will spill, under what rain conditions, and the impact that those spills will have on the environment. SIPA regularly monitors the water environment to ensure that it is not impacted by sewage spills. And in 2019, it uh, took 19,000 monitoring samples across Scotland to safeguard the water quality of our river, rivers, our locks and our coastal areas. So a significant amount uh, of monitoring that goes into those uh, overflows. Uh, but of course, uh, given uh, Foyce O'Chaudhry's question, uh, more than happy that the government uh, will give consideration uh, to a meeting if you'd find that uh, useful. Thank you. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to some members of the judiciary expressing opposition to juryless rape trials. First Minister. The Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Bill includes proposals for a time limited pilot of judge only rape trials. The Senators of the Colleges of Justice response clearly sets out that they do have split views on the proposal. Organisations including Rape Crisis Scotland, Victim Support Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, uh, we know that they support the pilot. Uh, they, like many, they're concerned at the experiences of complainers, uh, the influence of rape myths and the lower conviction rates of rape. Uh, the Senator's response states, and, and I will quote directly, uh, that there is a serious problem with what happens in jury trials for rape cases, end quote. The pilot stems from the recommendations, of course, by Lady Dorian, uh, as I know Christine Graham is aware of. Uh, she is, of course, Scotland's second most senior judge. Uh, and, and as part of that report and review into how we improve the justice system, particularly for victims and survivors of rape, while also, and this is crucial, protecting the rights of the accused too. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the First Minister for his answer. I too have read the submissions from the Senators, both for and against. I am not quoting, but I will paraphrase. There is the evidential difficulty that most alleged victims and the accused were in a relationship, sometimes even after the alleged crime, and that may influence the low conviction rate no matter what we use. The right to a fair trial under the European Convention of Human Rights, which is embedded in the Scotland Act, as this may affect the accused, and I think, crucially, as the government, I understand, is to assess the efficacy of this pilot, for me, this trespasses on the principle of the separation of powers of legislature and judiciary, an extremely serious issue. So will the First Minister confirm there will be robust scrutiny of this proposal, that his government has an open mind as reflecting on these concerns and, indeed, my concerns? First Minister. Uh, yes, of course, we will... Uh... We will be open-minded in our consideration of the legislation. And that's why uh, the committee stage of this bill, the evidence-gathering stage of this bill, uh, is such a crucial part of the legislative process. It allows us to hear quite robustly, often quite powerfully, 
the various arguments being put forward. And I do go back to my point, of course, that this recommendation for a time-limited pilot of judicial trials is coming from a review conducted by the second and most senior judge, a very experienced judge, I think a judge who commands wide, uh, wide uh, uh, right across, uh, respect right across the political chamber, uh, as, as Lady Dorian does. And therefore, it's important we do uh, give uh, that weight, as we do also give uh, weight to those voices who have expressed concern, not just the judiciary, but we know many members of the legal profession um, too. So we will, of course, give that weight. We will also give uh, the, the voice of victims and survivors weight uh, in this, uh, uh, this decision uh, and the passage of this bill uh, too. And we do need to improve the experience of rape complainers. I think all of us uh, absolutely accept. I think all of us would also accept the rape myths that do exist within juries uh, as well. And maybe I'll end uh, with a quote from Rape Crisis Scotland, which has stayed with me since my days uh, as Justice Secretary and to this very day. And, and I quote them that many survivors describe the process of going to court more traumatic than the rape itself. That is an unacceptable position in any uh, justice system, let alone ours. Yeah. Ivan McKee. The case for judicialist trials in rape cases often cites the work undertaken by Professor Fiona Lerowick and her 2020 report on juries and rape myths. However, that report concludes by stating. Before suggesting anything as drastic as removing juries from criminal trials, however, it is worth considering whether the answer might lie in addressing problematic attitudes via juror education. This, it is argued in the report, is the way forward before more radical measures are considered. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Yeah, I, I think it's not a case of just doing either or. I think uh, that's absolutely acceptable to explore both. So I think education, uh, of course, trying to tackle rape myths in society more generally is something that is incumbent upon us uh, to do in government, but also to consider uh, the pilot. Um, Ivan McKee was right to reference, I thought, an excellent piece of work, uh, the most comprehensive jury research undertaken, I think, in the entire UK, uh, that work done by uh, Professor uh, Fiona Lerwick, uh, James Chalmers uh, and uh, others. Um, I, I may be uh, I'm happy to correct the record if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that uh, Professor Ler uh, Leverick uh, does support uh, the proposal uh, for a pilot. Uh, I do welcome steps that the judiciary have taken to improve jury education, um, and I, and I uh, will highlight um, the senators' uh, comments from the senators uh, testing rape myth directions with juries this year, and, and I'll quote um, that uh, when it came to judge directions, they, they did not prevent acquittals which appear to the trial judge to be conspicuously generous on the evidence uh, adduced. So there is uh, definitely a role for uh, education around rape myths. Briefly, First Minister. There is, uh, but there is also the option I think we should be exploring at juryless trials. Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Lawyers across Scotland say they will boycott the SNP's planned juryless trials, with senior judges also raising concerns that removing jurors constitutes political meddling in the independence of the judiciary by this SNP government. So, as I asked his Justice Secretary yesterday, will Hamza Yusuf ignore these concerns, pass his bill and simply hope for the best? First Minister. Of course, we will listen uh, to the views of the legal profession. We will listen to the, of course, weight of opinion of the judiciary. Uh, and, of course, we will give uh, appropriate weight to the voices of victims and survivors too. But I do go back to the central point. I would make this point quite robustly to Russell Finlay, that this uh, pilot or proposal for a pilot of judicial trials uh, is coming from Lady Dorian. Yeah. It is not government interference yeah. by simply exploring a recommendation from the second most senior judge, the Lord Justice Clark yeah. of Scotland. So I think it does not do an issue that requires great sensitivity, exactly. any justice, where yeah. we attempt to throw around yeah. terms like yeah. political interference, yeah. regardless of who that comes from. So I think let us absolutely give consideration to the voices of the judiciary. Yeah. Let's also not forget the, victor, the voices of victims and survivors in this issue too. Absolutely. Question number five, Sue Weber. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the use of antidepressants in Scotland. First Minister. I understand the impact and suffering depression can cause uh, sufferers and their families. I'm committed to improving care 
support and access to treatment. It's important that we recognise many people in Scotland benefit from the use of antidepressant therapy. We established a short life working group on prescription medicine and withdrawal, which reviewed antidepressants use across Scotland and involved clinical stakeholders and people with lived experience. In response to this group's recommendations, we will shortly publish a prescribing guide on antidepressants. This provides practical and evidence-driven guidelines on safe and effective prescribing through promotion of person-centred medicine reviews. Sue Webber. First Minister, the number of adults and young people being prescribed antidepressants has significantly increased over the last 10 years to over a million. Prescriptions are for a wide range of disorders and illnesses. At the same time, the NHS mental health spending as a percentage has declined between 2011 and 2022. Does the First Minister accept that there is clearly a link between the failure to access mental health services and the subsequent increase in prescriptions? Patients are asking for more than pills. What will ministers do to provide this critical access to mental health services? First Minister. I cannot be the only one who listened to that uh, question that is really disturbed by the insinuation yeah. that antidepressants are not a legitimate treatment for those who require it. And they can also be they can also Members. be a part of a treatment. It doesn't mean that people only have access to medicine or only have access to, for example, psychological therapies. For many people there will be Let's um, hear the First Minister a mixture uh, of uh, both. In terms of our mental health uh, investment, I'm proud of this government's record of investment in mental health services over the last uh, number of years. Significant increases, not just in mental health services, but crucially in mental health staffing. And I'm more than happy to ensure that the Minister writes to Sue Weber with detail of that. And let me end by saying this, that ultimately these are clinical decisions and we should leave it for clinicians, not for politicians, to decide who is prescribed antidepressants and who is not. Paul Sweeney. Presiding officer, research from the Royal College of Psychiatrists released today has shown that 58% of people in Scotland think that mental health services receive too little of the health care budget. And by the Scottish Government's own measure, that 58% of people are correct, aren't they? This government commitment of 10% to be spent on mental health as part of the overall health care budget is not being met with just 8.7% being allocated currently. In cash terms, that means we are £180 million a year short. So will the First Minister confirm if that 10% target for mental health spending is still a priority for his government? And if so, how will he personally ensure that it is met? First Minister. It is still uh, our uh, aim, our ambition and our target. And since 2007, mental health spending has doubled in cash terms from £651 million to 1.3 billion and uh, if you don't want to take my word for it, if, if Paul Sweeney doesn't want to take my word uh, for it, if I look at the, the latest Audit Scotland report yeah. in relation to mental health, uh, if I look specifically at paragraph 70 of the report, it says between 2017-18 and 23-24, the Scottish Government's mental health directorate budget increased significantly. That's a direct uh, quote and uh, again I'm more than happy for the Minister to furnish Paul Sweeney with further details of the significant investment in recruitment of CAMS, uh, CAMS staff in particular uh, and of course the fact that we are seeing record numbers of young people through those services and I want that to continue and I want those improvements to continue too. Question number six, Co-Cap Stewart. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on the work that the Scottish Government is undertaking to support the establishment of a pilot safer drug consumption facility. First Minister. I welcome the decision taken yesterday by the Integrated Joint Board, which, following the position taken by the Lord Advocate in the Safer Drug Consumption Facility proposal, now allows Glasgow to move ahead uh, with this pilot. We've been consistent and our commitment to support the setup of a safer drug consumption facility, which included facilitating work between Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership and Police Scotland to develop the proposal that was then submitted to the Lord Advocate. We provided Glasgow with uh, an absolute assurance around funding in advance of yesterday's meeting of Glasgow's Integrated Joint Board to discuss the establishment of uh, such a facility. We will also continue to play an active role in the planning and implementation work to ensure that the facility is delivered 
in a timely manner and, of course, fully evaluated too. Go Cap Stewart. Um, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Alongside other Glasgow MSPs, I wrote to the Home Secretary regarding this issue last month. The response suggests that the Home Office will not stand in the way of the Lord Advocate's uh, authority on this matter, uh, providing its exercise lawfully. Whilst welcome, it is disappointing that the UK Government seems unwilling to work with the Scottish Government to actively progress this public health measure. Does the First Minister agree? It appears that the UK's inaction on this matter is a political rather than pragmatic and that true cooperation from the Home Office on this would help provide even better care and support. First Minister. Uh, I, uh, I, do, I do agree with uh, Co-Cap Stewart. She's right that, uh, of course, the, the easiest way, the simplest way and the quickest way to have had such a facility up and running would have been, of course, if the Home Office gave approval. I'm not sure why uh, Labour seemed to be acting as a human shield for the Conservatives, uh, but what I would say to Labour and Conservative members, members in this regard uh, is that even with the Lord Advocate's statement of prosecution policy, there are limitations on this pilot. In fact, it can only, uh, the, the, the Safer Drug Consumption Facility can only be uh, focused on this narrow pilot in Glasgow. I know there's been calls for other pilots to be established, but we know the statement of prosecution policies for simple possession offences within this particular pilot. I do welcome the fact that the Home Office and the UK Government have said that they will not stand in the way. I would urge them to take a public health approach to tackling drug deaths as we have done here in Scotland and give approval uh, so that we can hopefully uh, use safer drug consumption facilities as one of the tools and a whole range of tools to try to fight uh, what is still uh, unacceptably high levels of drug deaths here in Scotland. Thank you, First Minister. We move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In evidence to the Finance Committee, leading economists emphasise how crucial it is for the Scottish Government to invest in Scotland's infrastructure if our economies to grow and our living standards improve. What is the First Minister's response to the Auditor General's report published today that the UK Tory Government is expected to impose, at a time of high interest rates and inflation, a real terms 7% reduction in Scotland's capital block grant over the next four years, while the Prime Minister continues to dither over the tens of billions being squandered on the HS2 rail project. First Minister. Kenny Gibson is absolutely right to raise uh, the UK Government's cut to our capital budget, that real terms 7% cut to our capital uh, budget, because we know infrastructure investment is absolutely key yep. to securing inclusive economic growth and delivering high-quality public services. Um, we've been consistent about the challenges. We've been very open about the challenges facing our capital uh, investment plans and, and, of course, the tough decisions that we will need to, be, we will need to take uh, in relation to the, the budget 2024-25. Um, the challenging economic conditions of the last few years, resulting from Brexit, resulting from the disastrous mini-budget, uh, and the UK government not inflation-proofing the capital budget has resulted in that 7% real terms yeah. fall in our Barnet capital funding over the medium term. Um, we will, of course, look at what innovative finance models we can use to power that investment, infrastructure investment in the years to come. But that job has been made considerably harder by that 7% real term cut from the UK government. Yeah. Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A fire has devastated the former station hotel in Ayr, causing massive disruption to the rail network in the southwest of Scotland. I'd like to put my, on record my thanks to the firefighters who fought this fire and all other emergency workers involved. It is crucial Ayr station is opened as soon as possible. Can I ask the First Minister what financial help the Scottish Government will give stakeholders to help pay for the substantial cost they face to make the area safe and reopen this vital rail network? First Minister. Uh, can I thank uh, Sharon Dowie for her question and add uh, my appreciation for our emergency services, in particular Scottish Fire uh, and Rescue, who battled not just throughout the night but into the next day uh, in order to ensure that this uh, fire was under control. And they have always had my utmost respect, um, and that has only increased after the events uh, in terms of Air uh, Station Hotel. Um, the the uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have remained uh, in attendance, uh, but there's no further signs of fire. The site should be handed over to South Ayrshire Council. My understanding is today, uh, ScotRail, as Shannon Dowie may know, have introduced alternative arrangements 
with an emergency timetable and train service running from Prestwick Town, uh, supported by the replacement uh, bus uh, uh, transport. Uh, in terms of uh, the direct question that Shan Dewey asks, uh, of course the government will be open to discussions around what support we can provide in order to not just secure the site, uh, but to, 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 to make sure uh, that services are running uh, as uh, close to normal as they possibly can. Clear Baker. Um, thank you. The First Minister may be aware that tenants and homeowners were moved out of their homes in Tillicoutry on Tuesday evening because of safety concerns after the identification of rack in the roof of their block of flats. This is clearly very upsetting and worrying for my constituents. Can I ask what discussion the Scottish Government is having with Clack Manager Council following the identification of rack in these homes? Whether financial assistance will be made available to local authorities and registered social landlords who discover RAC, and what assistance and advice can be given to homeowners who find themselves in this situation. First Minister. My thoughts very much are with the uh, families who have had to leave their homes. I recognise the impact this will have uh, on them. I commend the very quick action taken by Click Manager Council to make sure these households uh, are safe. And there is very regular dialogue between the Scottish Government uh, and COSLA on the issue of RAC. Uh, assessments of risks related to RAC are very much underway across the housing sector and information uh, will be provided as it becomes available. Uh, we are working closely with housing stakeholders to ensure the necessary action is being taken where risks are identified. Uh, Claire Baker will know from previous ministerial statements given as an update to RAC that we haven't received any additional funding from the UK Government in relation uh, to RAC, uh, but of course if there are additional financial uh, requests for funding uh, in relation to dealing with RAC from local authorities, we will give that due consideration. Fergus Ewing. Presiding officer, in the programme for Government, the First Minister reaffirmed the welcome commitment to dual the A96 as between Inverness and Aldern, including the Nairn Bypass. In November last year, the then Transport Secretary assured this chamber that the necessary statutory orders, compulsory purchase and ancillary roads, would be made in a matter of weeks. Nearly a year later, my constituents, presiding officer, are still waiting. Will the First Minister therefore ask the Transport Secretary to bring an oral statement to Parliament to explain why there has been such a further delay. The good people of Nairn and indeed of the whole of the north of Scotland are surely entitled to know what is or is not going on. First Minister. The people of, uh, the, of, people of, of, of Merness and of course uh, of Nairn uh, are absolutely due uh, uh, an update and I'm more than happy to consider a uh, ministerial statement, but uh, perhaps if it's more appropriate, uh, uh, an update, a uh, written update uh, to the member, to other members who've got an interest in relation to the A96. And our, of course, commitment remains, our manifesto commitment remains, uh, the duelling of the uh, 96, in particular the Inverness to Nairn, Nairn bypass. Uh, for reasons that are known to Fergus Ewing, uh, there is a review outside of the Inverness to Nairn section, there is a review uh, of uh, options that is being taken place for a number of reasons, including. Uh, our commitments uh, to uh, climate uh, obligations. But Frank Ewing is absolutely right. Uh, uh, we are uh, duty bound to give updates uh, to members of the public uh, in relation to our infrastructure projects, and including the A96. So I will give consideration to the ask that Fergus Ewing makes and decide what is the most appropriate way to update him, members of this chamber and members of the public, on our latest plans in relation to the A96. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, very tragically, last year there were 174 fatalities on Scotland's roads. Uh, that's increased 23% year on year, and it's actually at its highest level since 2016. Uh, I'm sure many of us in this chamber and our constituents have been touched by many of these tragic accidents. But, First Minister, that's also against the backdrop of a 14% drop in police road uh, traffic officers over the last decade. Many prominent road safety campaigners say there are clearly is a link, as does the Scottish Police Federation. Does the First Minister share my concerns and the concerns of road safety campaigners about these tragic statistics, and what is the Scottish Government going to do about them? First Minister. I uh, absolutely agree with uh, Jamie Green that uh, any life lost is tragic, and my condolences go out to every single family, every single community that has been impacted by a death 
on our roads. Um, what I would say to Jamie Green is when it comes to Police Scotland, we have, of course, increased funding to Police Scotland this financial year, significant increase to Police Scotland in terms of their resource budget. And, of course, we'll cont continue to consider what more we can do to support Police Scotland. Uh, but we also know that interventions, uh, uh, capital interventions on our roads can be quite important, whether that's signage, whether that's the appropriate speed cameras, whether it's any other intervention. And we'll consider uh, what more we can do uh, to make our roads as safe uh, as possible. We have uh, very ambitious targets in, to, to, in relation to reducing those uh, deaths uh, on our roads. Uh, and as, uh, I'll ensure that the Cabinet Secretary writes to Jamie Green with further detail on action we're taking in this regard. And Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Yesterday's decision by the UK Government to grant a licence to the Rosebank oil and gas field is nothing short of a climate catastrophe, condemning us to a future dependent on fossil fuels whilst the planet around us burns. It shows utter contempt for both our environment and the future generations who will live with the consequences. Will the First Minister join me in condemning this decision? And can he confirm if the UK Government carried out the climate compatibility assessment needed before this licence was granted? First Minister. Well, I've uh, gone on record to say that I think it's the wrong uh, decision to approve uh, Rosebank uh, at, a time, at a time when the world is literally on fire, when the planet is burning, when we have seen the most devastating impacts of the climate catastrophe. Instead of showing climate leadership, what we have from the UK Government is complete and utter climate denial, presiding uh, officer. And Scotland's future, the North East future, is as the net zero capital. It's not as the oil and gas capital, it's transitioning from that to a net zero capital. That's the future I want to see for Members, the let's hear the First Minister. And that's why we have, of course, invested £500 million in that just transition fund. So while the Conservatives believe in unlimited oil and gas yeah. extraction, yeah. infinite yeah. oil and gas yeah. extraction. Yeah. We believe in a greener, more sustainable future for Scotland. And as ever, the Conservatives on this issue, as with many other issues, will be on the wrong side of history, presiding yeah. officer. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, presiding officer, during our members' debate on the 31st of May, John Swinney intervened to say I was incorrect to state that UK swimming pool funding from the Treasury was in addition to the Scottish budget. Mr Swinney has now admitted to me that he was wrong, apologised and corrected the record, and I thank him for that. However, on the 29th of June, I intervened on Minister Siobhan Brown, who is walking away, to state the same basic fact. The Minister responded that Barnet Consequentials had already been added to the local authority block. The Minister then wrote to me, apologising and corrected the record, and I thank her for that. Now, yesterday, I asked Minister Joe Fitzpatrick about the same UK swimming pool fund. In his response, he stated, as I said, the money has been allocated. It was allocated to budgets as part of £100 million of additional funding that went to local government at stage three of the budget bill. Presiding officer, stage three of the budget was in February, and as John Swinney admitted to me in his apology, the money was allocated by the UK government much later. For the SNP to make this mistake once was unfortunate. To make this mistake twice looks like incompetence. To make this mistake three times looks deliberate. Presiding officer, can you let me know if Minister Fitzpatrick has made any attempt to correct the record? And can you tell me if there's any action you can take given the torrent of corrections now being issued by Scottish Ministers, when such an important issue that affects our communities across Scotland has been obscured to such an extent. Thank you, President. Officer. Thank you uh, for your contribution, Mr Lumsden. I am unaware as to whether or not any um, attempt to correct the record has been made. It is, of course... All members will agree that it is of paramount importance that members, including ministers, give accurate and truthful information to the Parliament, correcting any inadvertent errors at the, first, at the earliest opportunity. And if a member has a question about the factual accuracy of another member's contribution, they should raise it with that member. And I'm sure at this point in the term, the Chamber is well aware that the Parliament has a corrections procedure and how that mechanism operates. Thank you. We'll have a short suspension at the moment to allow members to leave the gallery and those members of the public, I should say, leaving the gallery to do so before we move on to members' business.